Get Up Nation. My name is Ben Biddick. I am the creator and host of the Get Up Nation podcast, where I serve individuals, organizations, and societies to develop and sustain resilience and perseverance. I'm the co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance with former Major League Baseball player and CEO of Lurong Living, Adam Greenberg. The Get Up Nation podcast is brought to you in partnership with GotYour6Coffee.com, where Navy veteran Eric Hadley is committed to serving first responders, veterans, and their families through a variety of nonprofit organizations. No stranger to adversity, Eric has fused the necessity of coffee with his passion for public service. You're already purchasing coffee. Why not empower your coffee with purpose? Why not purchase coffee that not only has your six, but also has the backs of those who don a uniform of service for our communities and great country. Learn more about Eric and his freshly roasted award-winning coffee at gotyoursixcoffee.com. Also from Penguin Random House is a book I had the honor of writing the foreword for called Warrior's Book of Virtues, a field manual for living your best life. Combat veterans Nick Bennis, Matt Bloom, and Buzz Bryan share how lessons they learned during their service can help empower you into a life of deep and lasting virtue, no matter the obstacles you face. Available now at the links below. Welcome to this episode of the Get Up Nation podcast. Recently, I had the honor and privilege of speaking with Nancy Solari. During her childhood and teen years, Nancy faced tremendous adversity, witnessing domestic violence in her home, the divorce of her parents at age 10. She also witnessed her mother battle breast cancer and family members struggling with eating disorders. Nancy was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, which caused her vision to decline. After attaining her degree in broadcasting and psychology from the University of Oregon, Nancy studied film at William Patterson University. She worked for Oregon News, Good Day Oregon, Good Morning America and Entertainment Tonight. Nancy desired even more from life and wanted a career that would work with rather than against her blindness. She obtained her life coaching degree from the Institute of Professional Empowerment and launched her business in 2008 called Living Full Out. She writes books, she speaks and coaches people in living their life to its fullest. Nancy hosts the inspirational variety talk show called Living Full Out and the national Living Full Out with Nancy Solari radio show, which attracts callers in need of motivation to take action in their lives. Nancy, I'm honored to speak with you on the Get Up Nation podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So what are you working on today? When you're done with this interview, what, what's ahead for you? Oh, gosh, actually, I'm um, interesting. I'm working with many different clients right now. Some are on the business development front because we actually get a lot of companies that come to us to motivate their teams and so I'm kind of working with different clients there. We're in the process of writing a book so I'm doing some book edits today on that and we're also prepping for two radio shows on Saturday so busy busy. Excellent all right and will you share where you're currently located? I'm in Huntington Beach California. You live a life of powerful impact your list of accomplishments is long. Let's talk a a little about your childhood and your journey of resilience that has led you to where you are today. Your childhood was not easy. Will you share some of what you experienced? At a I had the perfect home, meaning colonial home, white picket fence, parents, and two sisters, right? And our dog named Scotty. But inside the home, there was just a lot of chaos, a lot of competition and anger, and obviously grew up with that domestic violence edge. And one of the things that's just natural to me is I don't love conflict. I'm not a nervous Nelly, but I'm also not one to just jump in and, and add to the mix. So I did a lot of watching. I witnessed a lot of my family's different behaviors and how they coped with stress, how they handled their different conflict states. And I kind of carried that into my career. It's interesting how here I am today in my 40s. But I look back at that 10-year-old girl and I think, wow, you were being prepared for what you do today. And I think that could be true for anybody in your audience. I think sometimes we have to look backwards to see what were we naturally good at? What were those superpowers that, you know, were just signature to us? And and it's not really a surprise that for a living, I listen to people and I guide them. If you're willing, would you share some about your vision loss? It sounds like It was gradual over time, began at the age of 16, which is a significant time for young people who are forming their identity and forming social relationships. What are some of the challenges you experienced as you began to lose your vision? When they told me at 16, and my sister, all three of us, we all have the same eye condition. When they told us that we 
had this eye condition, they said that we would be blind by 40. Now, I am in my 40s. I'm not fully blind, but I'm definitely legally blind, which means it's just really a patchwork of light and dark. I can't really see colors or edges or the details of someone's face. But it was definitely a shock. But then, you know, at 16, it hadn't taken its full effect. So there was a part of me that was in denial, like maybe they'll find a cure in time, right? Mm. But as the years went along and things started to fade away or blind spots started to occur on my eyes, which made it harder for me to see or focus, I had to get creative. And one of the things I think was implemented in me in my early childhood with the way that I grew up was that survival skill. So when I would lose different parts of my vision, what I mean by that is depth perception, right? Being able to see the edges of stairs. I would have to get creative where I knew if I would get to a stair, I would just tap the edge with my foot and kind of take a step with a little bit of caution, not knowing how deep the step would be. I had to get over being willing to ask for help. Back in the day, it was a little bit like, ugh, I don't want to put somebody out. I don't want to have to hold on to their arm. But now I'm over that because the thing is, it's worse if I fall and break my leg because now I'm legally blind hobbling on crutches, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's taught me to be humble. It's taught me to just be a little bit more patient. What were the support resources that you drew from to help you through some of these challenges? As you made the transition into adulthood, what was valuable to you to get you through these hard times? Great question. Uh, well, definitely number one, I had to really explore visual aids as my vision was decreasing and getting worse. I had to kind of up my game where I would not rely on my eyes, but rather my hearing. So, so much of what I use today is auditorial. My computer talks, my phone talks. I very rarely rely on my eyes today, and I'm fully functioning, right? I'm independent because of those devices. The other thing is, is I built a network of support, meaning that I have other friends who are blind, who understand my walk. I have other friends who have MS and other conditions where, again, they understand those awkward, maybe tearful moments where you wish that you could see, you wish that you could walk. And so I think having people that have had a similar journey is important. I also have a great support team, especially at Living Fill Out, my company, where my team, they're my eyes. I might be the visionary. I might be the one who creates the ideas, but they're the ones who build the website. They're the ones who do the technical. And that gives me a lot of comfort because it doesn't mean that I'm stagnant. It doesn't mean that I as a person can't grow or living full out my company can't grow. With the support of a team, you can actually move further than needing to do it all yourself. It's a sense of trust then that you establish with these people. They help you do things that you're not able to and you help them do things they're not able to to create this profound impact that must give great satisfaction to everyone involved because they know that they're a vital part of the team. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, just the other day, Someone on my team, one of my writers, she was having writing block, and I was like, wow, you're usually so fast and, and speedy. And all of a sudden, the tears started flowing. There was an emotional block for her, and I was able to be that that sounding board. And once she had a cry, once she flushed it out, once she was able to get it out in the open, then she was able to complete her writing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just kind of be that person for my team so that they can do what they're naturally good at for living full out. I love the humility you are describing here. A lot of times when we have an injury, an ailment, some sort of block stopping our capability, how frustrating that can be. How did you get to the point where you were able to accept that, where you were able to go on after the acceptance of it? Was there a period of resistance? Did you battle with depression? How did you get to the point where you live this life of humility where you find the beauty in what you can do. That's a really, really good question. I'm going to answer it a couple of different ways. Number one, I think as everybody in your audience can appreciate, we've all had that feeling of sorrow. We've all had that heaviness of weight. Maybe it's a physical weight where we know we need to work out, but we just don't do it and we feel just sluggish. It may be an emotional weight where we're just like a warrior through our day and we're not really honoring our feelings inside. There were many a times where by myself, I would have worries. I would be concerned 
and it's and it's interesting how in our mind we can have all the negative self talk in the world. You know, who's going to want to marry the blind girl, right? Uh, how will I ever succeed in in a career if I can't see? What will my lifestyle be like? Will I be home all the time, or will I be able to travel? And what I understood is that that negative cycle did not serve me. And for anybody who has recently had this moment, you'll understand when you're by yourself and you're caught in a negative cycle of thoughts or woes me or victim, it is just a really ugly time. It is a sad time. But the thing is, is we have the ability to get ourselves out of that negative energy. So what I found is when I was around other people that inspired me, then it made blindness seem so much smaller. Like, for example, on our radio show, I interview people all the time that have no arms, no legs, other people who have been at 750 pounds and lost it and went all the way to 250, no surgery, just working hard. And I hear these people's stories and I think, wow, what do I have to complain about, right? And maybe some of your listeners today are hearing my story going, what do I have to complain about, right? I think when we open up our mind and we look at the world, we look to see how connected we are, but we also look and we see how small and insignificant those stresses, those worries are. They really put us in check. I I hope that makes sense to your audience, but I constantly throughout the years, when I had a negative thought, a woes me moment, I would put myself in check by looking out there and seeing other people that are in a greater need, a greater stress than me. Those limiting thoughts that you were experiencing of being homebound or being not able to travel. And on your website, you talk about all the traveling that you do do and and all the things that you do achieve. I can't imagine how going from that space internally, thinking you may never travel, you may never experience these amazing places, to then being on the beach once you have gotten the courage or once you have made that transition out of self-defeat or critical self-talk to the point where you are confident, where you are seeking after what it is you want and then experiencing the sand on your feet, the feel of waves, the smell of the sea, how satisfying and how victorious it must feel to achieve that when once you may not have allowed yourself to even think that that was possible. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I just, without my vision, I just interpret life differently. Like when I went to Paris a couple of years ago, granted it was really hard to see the Eiffel Tower, but I just love everyone's accents and I just felt like I was in Beauty and the Beast. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like listen to their accents and everybody's so polite. It was just so magical. I made the magic happen because of what I heard, what I smelled the experience I had with my other senses, not what I saw. Same with recently when I went to Mexico. It was really fun to listen to the Marachi band, right, and dance to the music. And I had just as good a time as all the sighted people. I wanted to ask you, especially with young people who are formulating their identity, who are wondering about future relationships and future employment and all the opportunities that are out there. And then to experience challenges at that point, it can often alter our perspective of what's possible for us. Or we develop self-limiting beliefs because of messages we either receive internally in our own head or from media or from negative influences. At what point did you make the discovery of the gift that was within your challenges, that everything that you had gone through could only make you more powerful, more connected, and more able to serve other people who may have experienced similar adversity or adversity in any form that you could learn from your own and give them the gift of overcoming theirs. Yeah, that's a really good question. Don't we wish that we could read the last page of our book first, right? Right. (laughs) But we can't. And so, like so many people in my teens, in my 20s, I did fumble through and try and test and make mistakes and succeed at times. And I think that's just what that time period of your life is for. I do remember being at KFWB. That's when we, the first station that carried our show. And I remember the very first night sitting behind the mic thinking, wow, I made it. 
I mean, I'm here. Mm. It was very magical because I was thinking, wow, the psychology degree, the broadcasting degree, all those jobs, all the keep working, the stretching, the building, I'm here. And I think we can all have that moment of, I'm here. It might be when you feel really stable and comfortable and safe and happy in a relationship. Like I got through all the broken road, bad relationships to the one that makes me feel safe and home. Or it might be in a career where, gosh, I, I thought I wanted to be in this career, but wow, this this feels very purposeful and I think I've I think I've now found my new home, right? So we don't always know what it's going to be like. You just have to let life unfold. You have to feel it and make your best educated guess. You just have to go right or have to go left. You're not going to know until you make the decision. But that's why they say life is like a game. Play the game of life. Play it full out. How have these challenges you've experienced inspired you to be so active, to desire greater positive impact in people's lives, to work in so many different fields, and to have the motivation that evades many others. Is there a relationship between having limitations that are imposed on us to the fire that drives us toward action? I do believe so. Now, this does nothing to do with a disability, right? But when someone says to you or to anyone in your audience, you can't do that, no one wants to hear those words. Oh, yes, I can, and I'm going to show you, right? So the thing is, is a disability, an adversity, a loss of any kind, it's like being told you can't or you won't. And some people will believe that and they will stop right in their tracks and they'll be like, I guess I can't. I guess I never will. And other people, and I guess I fall into this group, when I hear those words or when life gives me an unexpected curveball and it's a negative one, I'm going to rally and figure out how I can get back on track, how I can overcome that. I guess it's that tenacious spirit. And I think that energy that I have does come from, again, going all the way back to my childhood, those survival skills, those how can I make my family more peaceful? How can I make a difference in the world? How can I not just be, quote, quote, this blind person? How can I utilize my not seeing and the benefit of all my other senses to live a full life. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. So I think you just kind of take the card in life you, you're given and you run with it and you find the positives of that card, not the negatives. Will you share your process of deciding to become a life coach? You've succeeded in so many other avenues in broadcasting, in real estate, in all of these different areas, but you became really interested in becoming a life coach. What led you to get that certification and serve people in this way today? What I love about coaching is that it's really about the present and into the future. I'm a strong believer and everybody should go to a counselor, a therapist, a coach. If you need support, and it might be healing from your past, that would be great to go to a therapist and, and do that work. But if you are looking to advance into the future, if you are looking to take that dream, that goal, but you're trying to figure out how to connect the dots or bring in the resources, that's where coaching is effective. So I really grabbed hold of life coaching because I wanted people to not feel limited by expectations, by mistakes, by maybe a disability. I wanted them to know that what they wanted was possible. It just means that we might have to be, get creative with how you get there. It might mean that we have to adjust that vision a little bit. You know, if somebody wants to be an astronaut, okay, not everybody can be an astronaut, right? But maybe there's ways to appreciate space the understanding of that career in a different way. Maybe it's a hobby. So I think people need to really focus in on what is the passion and what do you admire so much about it and then figuring out how do we attain that? Is it really meant to be a career or is it meant to be a hobby? Because I think not everything has to be a career. Part of this is that profound sense of gratitude. Don't you agree that Taking in our lives and our challenges, we really reorient ourselves and center ourselves by developing a sense of gratitude for 
the good that's there for the opportunity. Yes, we may not be an astronaut, but we may be able to volunteer at a local astronomy center and share the awe of space that we have with children on field trips or, or things of that nature. There's always a way to invest. There's always a way to inspire or take action, help advance where we're trying to go. What role does gratitude play, especially for those who have experienced adversity in their growth? Gratitude is so important. And I think that it's important to be grateful daily, if you can, but at least give yourself the space within the week to be grateful. Take 30 minutes, think about what's good in your life. You know, when you do that, you're automatically going to get juiced up. You're going to have a bump, an energy bump, because you will see what you're grateful for. And, and those can be the smallest things. One of my service dog, uh, Lionel Richie is his name, mm -hmm. uh, he's 13 years old. He has developed a heart condition, so he is getting a bit sicker as the years go along. But I can get really close to his face, and I can say, thank you for guiding me. Thank you for being in my life. You know, I know it's not going to be forever, but till his last breath, I will continually tell him that I'm grateful. Or not everybody can go out and buy clothes when they want to. So although I can't see my clothes, I do tend to shop with a friend. Whenever I am able to buy something and feel really good at it, good in it, and go out there and just enjoy feeling like you're wearing something new, you kind of got that swagger, right? Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for the ability that I can purchase those items. So I think that you just have to look at the, the big things in life. You know, I'm thankful for my home. I'm thankful for my friends. I'm thankful for my career. But you got to look at the little things. I'm thankful for my dog. I'm thankful for the ability to buy clothes. When do you have the most fun in, in your average day? I actually have fun doing so many things. Like being here with you is fun. Talking to people on my team is fun. Now, don't get me wrong. I also really enjoy, like, surfing on YouTube, finding videos. I find that fun. Playing my guitar is fun. I love to sing. Everybody knows in my life I enjoy karaoke. It's like every time my birthday comes around, what do you want to do? Karaoke. You know, that's what we do. And I think you have to find something fun every day. Even if you have a monster day and responsibilities right and left, I think you have to find one fun thing in the day, even if it's watching your favorite episode for 30 minutes because there's no guarantees of tomorrow. What if you're planning, I'm going to have fun next week. I'm going to have fun next month. You might not have next week or next month, right? Yeah. So have fun today. In your resilience process, what role does humor play? Big, 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 especially with losing my vision. Now, I, I don't poke fun at myself. I don't poke fun at other people with disabilities. I'm very sensitive to that. But for me, like, for example, when I would be dating somebody, right, going on these dating apps or dating websites, you know, I don't see the person's face, their profile. I can read their profile, but I can't really see what they look like. And a lot of times I would date with my friends. I would say it's match.com or something. And my friend would log in from Oregon. She'd pour a glass of wine. I'd pour a glass of wine. We'd look at the profiles, message them. But then when I go on the date, here I am needing to tell the person about being legally blind. But I would say to that person, you want to know the good news? And they would say, yeah, what's the good news about being legally blind? And I would say, well, here's the good news. I will never see your gray hairs. I will never see your wrinkles. Okay? Keep smelling good. Keep going with that sexy voice. But those things I won't see. I don't see overweight. I don't see race. So in some ways it's very freeing because I bond with people based upon their personality. I always end the show with six questions to help my listeners understand the why within my phenomenal guests. Are you willing to run through these six quick questions with me? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Who are you thankful for today? Number one, my mom. Best friend in the world. Hands down. And then Lionel Richie. I love my dog. Remember him. Yep. <laughs> And now that we've covered who you're thankful for today, what are you thankful for today? I am thankful for the vision I do have, even if it's just light and dark. And I'm thankful for my mind. Everybody just is in awe of how I can remember things, numbers, places, time. So my mind, I'm thankful for. How do you fuel the fire within you? I feel it through music. I feel it through the texture of people's voices. 
and it's really just a feeling. You just kind of lead with your heart in life. What is one thing adversity taught you to value? I need to value patience and letting life just unfold and really trusting in the process. What are you doing today you may have never thought you could? I would say just having that tenacity to keep going. I wonder when I'm going to burn out and get tired, but I haven't gotten tired yet. Bring it. And then what will you do tomorrow you may have never thought you could? I will probably continue to travel and I will probably continue to do things that I've never done before. Driving a wave runner and I can't see where I'm going, right? Or, you know, um, haven't done skydiving yet. I'd like to try that. Just doing things that are outrageous, not dangerous, but, you know, you always want to get those butterflies in your stomach. I'm all about the butterflies. How can people learn more about you and your amazing work? They can go to livingfullout.com. That's the central hub for everything. So you can listen to our radio show there. You can check out our blog. You can tap into all of our social media. And most of all, you can get in touch with me by phone or email. Just go to livingfullout.com. Thank you for listening to Get Up Nation. This is where, when you find yourself in darkness, my guests help us all find light. Thank you, Nancy, for sharing your passion for life and your commitment to living full out.